with you in shit, 2005, I think it was, uh, for that one concert with Michelle yeah. Dunor and Roberto was because I think someone gave me Escapade and Skull View, and well, I think it was those two. And yeah. you had like the most unique, amazing, one of the most unique tenor sax sounds I've heard in jazz, which is like, let's say nowadays, quite hard to achieve. And my question first would be like, how did you develop, how did you work on this sound, tenor sax sound of, sound of yours, this kind of Wayne Marshish, but not really like, it's like Julian, Julian Arguez, you know? Yeah, well, you raised some, for me anyway, interesting things. Um, People have often compared me to saxophone, other saxophone players, but strangely enough, I, there's no one saxophone player that people say, yeah, he's, he's really like that guy. So people say, oh, yeah, he's like Jan Garbrecht, I've had. Oh, yeah, he's like Wayne Shorter. He's like, yeah, uh, he's like definitely like Coltrane. People say, oh, Dewey Redman, I can hear Dewey Redman. Warren Marsh has come up a few times where people say they think I sound a little bit like Warren Marsh. So I've had a whole range of um, saxophone players that people have thought, oh, he's got a similar sound as that. Mm -hmm. but, um, I sound was was not really one of those things that I worked worked out. Oh really? Yeah, I, 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 as you know, I do a lot of teaching now, um, mm -hmm. and it is one of those things that a lot of saxophone players feel the need to uh, sort of work on with long tones and. Um, yeah, you know, there's a certain set of skills you you can work on to try and change your sound, but it, that was never anything I thought about or worked worked on. I mean, I obviously cared about sound, but I never really did anything. I didn't do long tones or over tones or anything oh, like that. that. I was always too when I was practicing. I was always too impatient. I didn't want to spend half an hour in long tones or any of that. So I just really never, I never really worked on sound like that. I just let it all sort of happen organically, I think. But if, if you look at it back now, I mean, in your beginnings in jazz, right? It's like, yeah. did, did you already have in the beginning this smooth flowing sound, this and this style of impro that you have now, the language, was it already there in the beginning, kind of? Or? Well, it depends what you, you, you say in the beginning. I mean, I started pretty young. I, was, I think I started saxophone maybe about 10 or something. Oh, wow. And I, I got the bug quite early on. Firstly, I was really into Charlie Parker and the bebop language. So that was my thing when I was 12 and 13. I was really into oh, wow. Parker. And I was, um, I was doing gigs from the age of 13, 14, I mean, just little little local gigs and big band gigs. And, and then I, I joined some youth jazz orchestras, which were um, starting to do gigs all around the country sort of thing. But at that point, it was Charlie Parker, and I was really struggling with it, but I, 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 I did practice a lot. So I worked on a lot of things, really quite specifically, but I wouldn't say... I wouldn't say sound was one of those. And early on, I did sound like a really bad imitation of Charlie Parker. And then later on, I sounded like a really bad imitation of Coltrane. And I got obsessed by Coltrane. Really? Uh, I, 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 sounded, I sounded like you would say, oh, yeah, that guy really likes Coltrane. Really? Yeah. You did like early Coltrane probably, right? I mean, early, like not, not the later stuff. Or... Uh, yeah, the later stuff came... Um, Luckily, it came later. So, um, yeah, I think I was always really into that sort of 60, 61, yeah. 62 sort of thing around that time. So I wasn't, it wasn't the really early stuff. Yeah. It was all the, um, you know, the really stretching out sort of beginnings of the modal stuff. That's what I was particularly into. Oh, that was, I, I would have been about 16 then, something like that. Yeah. And did, did you transcribe his solos? Or? Well... I transcribed bits of a lot of saxophone players, bits I wanted to kind of understand I would transcribe. So I never did whole solo. So if there was a bit of Coltrane, I, I, I thought, what the hell is that? I would transcribe that. Same with 
any musician I really enjoyed. So I remember transcribing a bit of Wilton Felder and some Wayne Shorter and there's some Joe Zavanaugh, which I didn't quite understand with Weather Report. But all that sort of couldn't work out if it was what it was, if it was pentatonic or or something, but that sort of language he had. So I transcribed a bit of that and um, when I first discovered myself, uh, um, mm -hmm. Keith Jarrett, I transcribed bits of that as well. Yeah. So I, I never, I never really did whole solos. Um, one of the important things I think, which made me what I am, is that I didn't have any lessons. So I, I didn't go to college. I didn't have jazz lessons or. Uh, I didn't have, I had a saxophone teacher who told me that the thing rings and he, he came for about six months when I was a young guy. Um, but I never had jazz lessons. I never went to jazz school or anything like that. Wow, so you never studied jazz basically? No, I didn't, no. N neither jazz composition? No, no, nothing like that. Uh, the, oh, wow. the, the, only, the only education I had, I, I would say anyway, it was um, at school I did we, we call them O levels and A levels, which is up to the age of 16 and then up to the age of 18. Um, and, and they were, of course, on, about classical music. It wasn't very practical. It was more listening to music and writing essays and stuff like that. But my, my teacher at the school, he was a kind of failed organist. Um, and he loved Bach. So he, he used to show me a lot of, we did a lot of two-part harmony and a lot of four-part um, harmony, and I really got into it, you know, trying to imitate Bach, and yeah. so that was really the only composition or arranging um, lessons that I had. Um, but I somehow feel really grateful for those um, harmony lessons with a guy called Mister Bagley, John Bagley, because they were really, uh, you know, it gave me insight to certain fundamentals which I've yeah. enjoyed and I still find useful. So, so basically when you started music it's it just like you basically learned through mistakes or I mean you learned through practice. I, I learned through practice, uh, I learned by going to a lot of gigs and of course mostly I learned from recordings. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I think I was good at um, isolating the problems about my own playing and then trying to find a solution to them. And, yeah. and mostly, I don't think it's rocket science. You know, so if you've, got, if you've got dodgy time, you know, you've got to get a metronome together, you've got to start yeah. doing things quite slowly and, you know, being quite focused on time. And then, yeah. you know, you've got to be patient and all those kind of things. And, after a number of months or weeks or whatever yeah, it is, you yeah, get, yeah. get things together, you know. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Do, do you remember some, some, some jazz concerts when you were young that you attended, that, you, that stayed in your mind, that kind of influenced you in a way, or...? Um, yeah, I do. I remember, I remember a whole bunch of um, concerts which... I mean, there were. I mean, I used to go every week to a gig somewhere, um, and there'd be local guys, and some of them I, I really learned a lot from. Then there'd be some sort of national guys, people who like, grew up in Birmingham. And they'd come up from London, mm -hmm. and I'd go and hear these guys like Pete King and Don Weller and uh, Bobby Wellens, and just think, oh my God, they're brilliant! You know, these these guys who are very much in the tradition. But I remember when I was 16, I heard Evan Parker. Uh -huh. And that blew my mind. Because at that point, I was into Coltrane, but, and I was into starting to get into ECM music and a bit more of a European thing and a looser thing and a freer thing and stuff. And then I went to see Evan Parker do um, a solo gig. And I could not believe it. I had never heard anything like that. So that really blew my mind. Uh -huh. totally. That was brilliant. And then I remember seeing Kenny Wheeler and John Taylor all around that same age, 16, 17, 18. Um, yeah. Starting to really love um, a more of a European thing, if that's the right expression, or maybe less traditional. Yeah. 
thing. Yeah. And Interesting. Then and all those kind of things and um, it was all, all a powerful influence on me. Yeah, definitely, especially then later you got to play with many of these guys actually, that was uh, probably... Well, was, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, I mean it was amazing to do my first gig with Kenny, for example, because um, I think it was only 19 or something when I first did a quintet gig with him and it was just like, oh my god, I'm, I, this is a real hero. I'm playing with a hero. How so did this happen? I think um, I think the very first gig might have been with Ronan Guilfoyle in in Dublin. Huh, yeah, bass player. Yeah, and I think I was eighteen or nineteen, and I hadn't rep met Ronan, and I hadn't. I can't remember if I'd met Kenny. At that point. I think I did know him actually. But I was always a bit nervous, but then I was doing a sort of quintet with him and then uh, a couple of things happened. And before I knew it, I was actually, he was calling me to do some gigs. So it just, yeah, it was really lovely. Really nice. How was it like to play with him? I mean, you know, he's also one of my heroes, like all those, The Widow and The Window and Glue High and all, I mean, all yeah. those records. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. How was he like to play with? Like, He, he was... Um, he was a dream to play with because everything he ever played was brilliant. Oh, yeah. Even if he, I mean, he had, he had that sort of um, magical thing, which I don't think many musicians ever reach, but, you know, he would fluff something or split some notes, but it always sounded like a oh, heart. That is so beautiful. Um, and so melodic. Yeah. In any situation, it could be a really fast tempo thing, or a free thing, or a ballad, or something you didn't know very well, or, or one of his own shoes. It, everything sounded absolutely like you wouldn't want to change a thing. It was mm -hmm. pretty magical, I would say. Because like later, you did his orchestra. I mean, his big band, right? Yeah. So probably to play in a quintet that must have been, of course, much more. Amazing than, especially at the young age. Or well, playing in a quintet was uh, amazing because it, it's a bit more personal. So you're really interacting, and you know sometimes we're improvised together. So you know, and we're sorting things out on the gig, and it, it's it, you know what a, a, the quintet thing is. Uh, is a lot more um, personal and uh, intimate, I would say, uh, and that's why I particularly love that ensemble sides but the big band for me that was something incredible because uh the the tour we did for his 60th birthday which resulted in um music for small and large ensembles mm -hmm. um i remember working walking into the um the band room where we were rehearsing and i looked around and there were all these stars from the british jazz yeah. And then there was John Abercrombie, Pete Erskine, Dave Holland, of course, John Taylor, Kenny. It was just like, oh my God, this is, <laughs> this is, uh, you know, and I was 23, I think, or something. Oh, wow. it's like, oh my God, this is, this is something special. Surreal, yeah. And it was special. It was totally special. You mentioned these, your generation kind of musicians your age how, how important was the another kind of a big bandish loose tubes for you guys for you let's say or for the entire generation around you yeah well i was lucky because i was part of these different scenes um so you know i we've just been talking about john taylor and kenny mm -hmm. and john sermon and they're 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 obviously the older generation to me they had a profound effect on me but equally, the the scene which you're talking about, which is the loose tube kind of scene, which involved uh, Ian Bellamy and Django yeah. Bates, and my brother was part of that scene. And uh, Martin France, um, right? Sorry. Martin France also, right? Martin yeah. France was there, and there was just a group of incredibly strong and um, brilliant musicians who were all together and. They were all firing off each other, and that had a huge effect on me as well, in a different way. 
Um, they had an identity which mostly I related to. Yeah. Especially also, I think I checked like Loose Tubes who was in the band, in the band, like through periods, and then your bands, it's kind of a, you kept those musical relations also in your bands, in your octet, for instance, like many guys, then you kept going, right? Yeah, well, I think some of those relationships are that so important to me that, um, but they're important to me because the music is so great. So the reason I love playing with Martin Franz, for example, yeah. is not because he's like one of my best mates or I've known him almost as long as any other musician. It's not because of that, but it's because when I hear him, I just think, my God, that is yeah. great music and that's, that's the music I want to be part of. So that's the reason why I work so much with with Martin and a whole bunch of those people, Django included, I still Django, work. Yeah. Or Ian Bellamy, yeah. Bellamy, I see a lot, yeah. Mark Lockhart was in the band, yeah. a great player. Chris Batchelor, great player. So there's all these kind of things that, um, that, that band, Loose Tubes, enabled me to see or, um, you know, new experiences and, and, and also, an important thing for me about all this was I was always the youngest guy around. So I was very much um, soaking this stuff up. I wasn't really influencing them. They were more influencing me. Yeah. So, as I say, I was, I'm a bit younger than all those guys we've mentioned. So um, it had a, quite a strong effect on me. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And also, you, you mentioned you were part of many scenes. How did then... I listened to the other day uh, one CD you gave me, Let It Be Told. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you had this really strong connection to South African music, right? Yeah. How did this connection begin? Because this is with Chris McGregor, or how did that happen? Or how did Chris McGregor Gregor come into your life, let's say? Well, uh, again, this is a kind of slight connection with Loose Tubes in the fact, in the fact that Loose Tubes was very much uh, influenced by South African music. Yeah. Um, yeah, Django right. playing with Judah Bukwana, and my brother playing with Judah Bukwana. I ended up playing with Chris McGregor, and then there was a bunch of other um, collaboration sort of things going on. But the, the reason why all that happened was because uh, during the apartheid years of South Africa, a lot of South African musical exiles were living in London. Okay. Judah Bukwana was one of them. Chris McGregor lived in London for a long time. Um, so he had a quite strong connection with the UK scene, but um, he was living in France when I when I knew. Him. So all these South South African exiles were um, had a, a huge effect on the British jazz scene. Now we were just one generation, but the generation before, so people like Dave Holland knew Chris McGregor really well. Mm -hmm. uh, Evan Parker was in Brotherhood of Breath. Oh really? I didn't know. Wow. Yeah. So there was there's a there's a lot of there was a, they sort of I think they hit the scene in the sort of mid sixties, maybe late sixties, and they really influenced generations of of musicians. In fact, our generation is one of the last generations yeah. directly influenced by those guys because I think it was nineteen ninety or maybe ninety one when Mandela got out and you know. The political landscape changed, so people had the opportunity to go back, and there wasn't the uh, influx of musical exiles. So, we f I feel we were one of the last um, generations. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it was very powerful music that they played. And yeah. Perfect. And Loose Tubes yeah. had a quite a, you know, musically, we had, we had some of those influences, I think. Definitely. I mean, if, I think you can feel in your music like it's like a conglomerate of all the things you mentioned, like of this Coltrane-ish, Kijarit ish South African, ECM-ish stuff, then it's like Julian, you know? So it's like, when I listen to you, it's like, you know, like you're not really original, for me at least, in tenor sax sound, but also your compositions are like uh, really this especially the octet stuff, I would say, really recognizable. I mean, 
Yeah. And how, how did this happen, for instance? Like this kind of a, you, you seem to found, find to found to have found your own flow in a way. This. Well, I might not be the best person to to, to really talk about it, uh, ironically. But yeah. um, the thing is, I love so much music. So I like the jazz tradition. I like all this stuff we been talking about the, the, the European thing, Kenny, Kenny's music, John Sermon's music. I love classical music. I love folk music. I love groove music. I love free music. But all these things are, in me, they're, they're, they're an important influence on me. And yeah. um, I guess somehow I mash them all together. And I'm hoping it's something personal. It's certainly the music I believe in, but yeah. um... uh, definitely it is. I mean, at least for, for me, it, it's like I, I think I, I, I listened to Scalview, especially and those two that I mentioned in Escapade, like like zillions of times. That the CD stopped uh, working. <laughs> just, just it, you know, how you gave how you give a chance to all the musicians also in the band. You know, it's a big band, so like. Then you hear Mario playing something or Mike Walker, and it's like everything is so natural. And one question connected to these, like, how do you approach a composition like that, or compositions? Where do you get an idea? Do you compose on piano or? Normally, back then, I would um, almost only compose on piano. Um, so yeah. I never composed on saxophone. It was um, only piano. But during about maybe escapades, but this is the 90s we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah. So towards the late 90s, um, computers and software were starting to become more readily uh, accessible. I remember getting an Atari sort of eight track uh, MIDI thing, which when I plugged it into my, in my keyboard, it was just you know, I could start writing more detailed things that yeah. I couldn't write. I couldn't play on the piano. My piano skills are not that good. I can play chords, voicings, and stuff, but, and then sing the melody. So I think before that, those tunes were a bit more like that. You know, a bit, a bit more traditional in that sense, chords mm -hmm. and melody. But with um, the octet that you're talking about, I think I was. Trying to discover more layers yeah, of the writing, and the, the the introduction for me, at least, of the uh, computers helped me solve some of these problems because I couldn't play them on the piano. Um, also, you know, those records—they have all the things you're talking about. They have some free sections, mm -hmm. some groove sections. The writing is important, yeah. but some of the blowing is totally open. Um, you know, there's lots of. I mean, they're not always chord structures and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. It, it has lots of. If you break it down, it has all those influences that we've been speaking about in, in that music. You know. And so how do you approach a tune like? Uh... What are the juices, or I don't know if you remember those things, a gallows humor, or yeah, which are like really complex in a way, and they're like stories, you know. Yeah. How how do you let's say? I mean, I know how how I write a song like that for myself, but how do you approach a song like that? You know, do you start first with one section, then you kind of think of how do you do the arrangements also, and think of ways. Yeah, well, I, I, I never start knowing the whole picture. So if, if we're talking about one, uh, any particular tune, yeah. basically I, I start composing. I have a rough idea of if the tune's going to be up or fast or groovy mm -hmm. or, or, you know, harmonic or, you know, I have a rough idea because I need, I need a tune that's going to be a certain sort of colour. So when I get composing, I just write whatever feels good at the time and then I kind of start adding things to it. Sometimes I can add things at the beginning and move sections around. Oh, this needs a contrasting bit. Maybe this can come later. Oh, I need an ending. All these kind of things. Um, but one thing I would say is I write quite slowly. Mm -hmm. I'm not like one of these guys who can, like that octet music. You know, I, I probably spent six months writing all that music. Oh, wow. 
maybe that sounds like a long time, or maybe it doesn't, I don't know, but I worked hard at it. So sometimes, even when it, I think a lot of people would say, oh, that, that tune's finished, if that works, it's going to be okay. I would still live with it for a couple of weeks after that, deciding whether that one chord is right, or is that really the best intro I can have for that tune? Maybe there's another way, or is that oh. one section I'm not convinced by? So I would I would live with them and um, tweak them uh, so that when when I did present them to a band, I was usually pretty confident about how it was going to sound. Did you, when you wrote that music, or even now when you write music, do you write music with exact musicians in mind? So let's say you knew that you're writing for Mike Walker or for Django Bates or whoever, Mario Laguinha, or did you just write songs? I, with that band, I definitely work for the musicians. Yeah. Uh, usually I write for the musicians and I feel a lot more comfortable when I'm doing that. I can start to hear, you know, people's voices in a way. So, yeah, yeah I can really imagine Mike Walker playing that melody or yeah. definitely a solo section from Mario because he's so romantic and that would be the right section for him. So uh, I prefer writing like that. You know, it helps me solve any musical problems, basically. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned, I mean, I'm, you mentioned that I mentioned Mario. He's, for me, let's say, top five piano players, like, amazingly original. The Maria Joa stuff, his trio stuff is just like, you know. Yeah, it's lovely, yeah. Amazing. How did the connection with Mario begin? Because he's, like, present in your career for the last, I don't know, 25 years, maybe. Where did you meet him, or how did this develop, this really beautiful musical relationship? Well, it, it was just uh, a pure chance, basically. Um, there was a, there was some sort of collaboration between Portugal and Britain. Someone, one of these sort of promoters in Britain, managed to find a little pot of money uh, from European, some European fund to organise a uh, collaboration of two British musicians and two Portuguese musicians um, to do a little tour in Portugal and a little tour in the UK. And the musicians they chose for Portugal were Mario and uh, Bernardo Moreira, the, the bass player in uh, Mario Trio. Mm -hmm. yep. The two British musicians they chose were me and my brother Steve. So we went over to Portugal, and I remember very clearly the very first moment I met Mario, I thought, what a beautiful guy. We were talking, we had a coffee, what a really great guy. And, you know, never really heard him play, because back then you couldn't check anyone out online. It didn't exist. So <laughs> it was going to sound like the very first tune we played was a tune of mine uh, called Peace With Thee. And within eight bars, it was clear to me that this guy was fantastic. And it was also clear to me that this guy, I think, is going to... This is not going to be the end of it, just this one tour. This is not going to be the end of our relationship. It was so clear, and I knew that after eight bars. Oh, wow. felt like we really spoke... Um, we played the same... In the same way. We had a lot of influences which were similar. We... we, we they, they may they like come out in different ways, but we had a lot of the same thoughts about music. Yeah, yeah, it's it seems it, it's so funny. You, you you look at your some of those larger octet recordings, and it's like English musicians and Mario. And I, I always wondered, you know, how did this well, happen? Because it blends so naturally, you know. Yeah, and it, you know, back then it wasn't that easy to bring someone. I mean, the UK, you probably know yourself, the UK is actually quite hard to bring mu musicians from Europe because it's okay if you come from America, but if you come from Europe, it's, a, it, it's pretty hard. Um, so back then it wasn't easy, but as I say, at that point I was already playing in Mario's band. He had a quartet and a quintet, and I was in that really? record. So he was bringing me to Portugal quite a lot, and I fell in love with Portugal. And that's where I'm, I am now, actually, in Portugal, because of Mario. Because of Mario, because he showed me Portugal, and I always loved Portugal. I love the people and the music and the scene, so that's why I'm, I'm here now. But yeah. I, when when I was asked to put the octet together, they said you can 
you could choose the musicians. And I thought, well, I want Mario to do it. He hears the music in the same way I do. He's the guy I want. And um, as I say, it wasn't easy getting him to do gigs because often it'd be a one-off gig somewhere in like Belfast or something. He would have to go all the way over to do this one gig, but I'm glad we did it. Very glad. And I'm still playing with him now, of course. And we, we're doing this trip, so... I saw, yeah, that you have a new CD out, right? In the trio. You're going to have a, the new CD out, I think, is, is, is coming out in, I think, in September, October this year. So, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's magical what, what you guys do. That's so much fun. Right, so, thanks. This is, speaking of trios, then you had, like, uh, another thing going on. We talked about the octet now a little bit, and... Then you had lots of a strong period of playing with in trio uh, with Tom Rainey and Mike Formanic, right? That's right. Gr Ground Rush and Partita was it, I think, right? Like, yeah. And I think, oh no, but then you had also the, the other with Jim Black and Ronan on a one records. Yeah, that was a thing put together by Ronan. That that mm, particular yeah. tour. We, we enjoyed it, so we we, we we kept it going after the one tour. So we did quite a few. Tour, which that was fun as well. Yeah, but especially, especially the trio with uh, Tom and Mike, kind of, a, you, you did it quite a, quite a while and seemed like a working band. How did you, and this is a band that it seems, seems to me at least offered you really more freedom to do stuff because those guys are amazing. Yeah, they are. Kind of, a, then you, you could go, I guess, into this more coltrane -ish mode, but still stay in queue. How did you approach that trio or how was it like working in a trio format for you compared to other projects, let's say? Well, I don't tend to think of them as different, uh, but I, I think everyone else looking at them will, will perhaps see them as different. I don't particularly see it like that. I just see it as you play with musicians and you play the music which feels right and um, approach it in that way. But it was definitely, that, that particular trip trail with Mike and Tom was definitely more of a blowing thing. So I was yeah. bringing little heads in and um, maybe composition was less of, uh, less important or less, um, it was just, it wasn't such a big part of it. I'd say the octet, the writing was a fairly big part because it's, yeah. Octet, you've got lots of voices, and you know the, the composition was a bigger thing, a bigger part of it. But the trio was a bit more open, but that's yeah. because it it felt like it was uh, something I wanted to explore, you know. And I've always loved that saxophone trio thing. I've always enjoyed that um, that lineup, and I I still I'm still thinking about doing another uh, sort of jazzy. Not straight ahead because it's never going to be straight ahead, but quite a jazzy trio recording. Because uh, actually, the teaching in Graz has made me rethink my relationship to the tradition. Oh, because of, uh, I don't mean it in a bad way. It's just you know I grew up loving the American tradition, um, but then I think I moved away from it. You know, through Kenny mm -hmm. and the, or, you know, JT and all the stuff with loose tubes and the South African thing. And I think I, you know, moved away from it. But because I'm teaching in Graz, and a lot of the students, have, when they come to me, they're quite traditional. And, you know, you meet a, a first year and you say what you love, and they always say Dexter and uh, yeah. uh, early Coltrane. It's never late Coltrane. Early Coltrane. <laughs> and uh, they love Cannonball and Sonny Steer and Charlie Parker and, you know, Stuff that I grew up really loving myself, and so I want to help them just find their own music and do their own thing. So if they're into Cannibal, I'm, I'm not going to say, no, we need to look at some other stuff. But I just let yeah. them explore the music that, that interests them and try and help them in their own path. So it just meant, it's, it's enabled me to rethink my own uh, relationship with the tradition. You know. You, you you think you would ever do an album of standards coming from that or? Um, I don't feel that at the moment, but I, I'm thinking I might 
do an album which has more of a nod to the, the tradition than most of my other recordings. I'm thinking about doing that. I, I don't quite know how that would be because I think of the tradition as Ornette Coleman as well. So, yeah. so you know, the tradition does not have to be. Uh, Playing Stella by Starlight or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I, I can't see myself doing that particular work, but maybe something more. I mean, these are some of the things I've just thought about. That you know, uh, if you put all my records, uh, you know, as a as a leader together, there's very very few swing tunes on there. Yeah, it swings still. I mean, it's groove. It's grooving, but. I wouldn't say there's that many swing tunes. There's some, but not many. Maybe in the beginning, yeah, like really the quartet stuff, or with Steve, I think, or that's quite. Yeah, but there's some stuff on there, but even then, most of that stuff is. Yeah, groovy ish, yeah, okay. Certainly not traditional, I wouldn't say. I know what you mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but, you know, further on, there's, you know, I, I do albums with absolutely no swing stuff on them at all, you know. Yeah. It doesn't bother me. I'm not saying it has to be, but it's just a uh, swing was such a big part of my life early on, and yeah. it's certainly a big part of the jazz tradition. So I'm just wondering if uh, I'm going to um, revisit that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, but as a sideman, you did lots of such gigs, right? Probably. Gone, I did, yeah. When I yeah. first moved to London when I was 18, that's... That was it. Yeah, when you go to, you know, you go to jam sessions and it's standards. Uh, or if someone calls you up for a gig, it's standards. It, uh, I mean, not always, but if you were in bands, that used to be uh, composed music. But if, if it was, you get a call to do a yeah. gig on Friday, just show up at 7.30 and the gig starts at 8. You know it's going to be standards and... I did know a lot of standards, and you know, I I do like standards, but um, I don't play them now, apart from with students. Yeah, yeah, but that that's yeah, interesting. Really, really curious if, if you're gonna do it because you know I always see you as this really original voice. So it would be nice to 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 hear you. I mean, I, I hear you playing. I think you did a round trip with. Jim, no, with some of those guys. Or you did some Ornette, right? Yeah, we've always done some Ornette tunes. Um, yeah, I mean, th that comes really natural for that setting for you, like, you know. Yeah. But to hear you playing, I don't know, Body and Soul or something like that would be really curious, how, you know. Yeah, um, I mean, I do love those tunes and I don't mind playing them, but uh, recording them is a different thing, so yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I would really have to think about, you know, revisiting tunes which have been done a lot. Um, yeah. Well, well, also the question if it makes sense. It, it's like a, a poet who's like a really famous modern poet would write a collection after twenty collections of sonnets. You know. Yeah. It's it's yeah. But if you feel like it, feel like it, maybe yeah. You don't. You, you never know, right? Yeah, I think it's unlikely, but um, it's a possibility that, you know, it's, it's yeah. a door I don't want to close, but, um, yeah. No, I mean, if it's up to me, you just don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I weigh more, I mean, I really enjoy your com original composition, so it's like, don't, <laughs> you know. Yeah, thanks. Well, yeah. Um, but as I say, I grew up, um, I grew up loving all that that yeah. traditional stuff, so it's in there in a way. Yeah. It's like one of my first loves. So yeah. I'm not saying I would want to do standards now, but sure. I have a soft spot for it. You know. <laughs> Speaking of soft soft spots, uh, uh, one of mine is uh, I listened today to the Circularity, and. Uh, I think it's, yeah, circularity, yeah. yeah. And I wanted to ask you, I mean, okay, your collaboration with John Taylor, I think it's, he's on Phaedrus, right, in right. 1990? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and you have, like, Dave Holland on, on that, that quartet record and Martin France, I think. And yeah. How did this thing with Dave Holland happen? Like, okay, you got him to know, you got to know him through Kenny Wheeler, I guess, but... Yeah, that's right. I knew him from... Um 
from playing with Kenny. I think the small and large ensemble, the 60th yeah. birthday tour with Kenny, I think that might have been the first time I met him. But he was very, very friendly to me, and we kept in touch, um, and I'd bump into him every now and again. And we worked a bit with Kenny, in, you know, other, it wasn't just that one tour, so I, I, I worked with him a few times. Um, but that came about because I was sitting down with JT, John Taylor, mm -hmm. having a glass of wine or two, and I said, look, John, I want to I, I wanna do a record with you. And then we were just talking and having another glass of wine, and he said, who do you want to... Who do you want to do it with? And I said, well, he said, who would you really, really want to do it with? And I said, I'd really like to do it with Dave and Martin. And he said, let's do it, let's do it. And it was, it was really easy to put together. It was really easy. You, know, you, you contacted Dave then? Or? Yeah, I was direct to Dave, and he said yes, straight away. Oh, oh yeah. So it's, um, he's got a manager, and she worked out all the sort of details of, uh, you know, you know, when he's going to be available, all that kind of stuff. But it was super easy. I sent him all the music, and he was asking me, sending me messages, asking me about the music. Are you sure uh, this tune? Maybe I can play the melody on that tune. And oh, are you sure that note's right? You, you know, it's, it's obviously it came very well prepared. You know, so. Um, oh really? Well, and, really. And he, as I say, I knew him, so I knew how conscientious he was, and um, you know. I'm such a lovely man that I knew it wasn't going to be anything weird or. Yeah. yeah well, did, did you ever play live with that quartet? Or? Um, no, we didn't. We didn't. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's the compositions on there are like again. I mean, the playing, everything is amazing. Thanks. You mentioned John, also Taylor. Like for me again. Top three piano players, top five. I, I, you seem to know the piano players I like, or like, I like the piano players you work with. I don't know which way it is, but anyway, you know. I'm quite choosy about piano players. Yeah, I mean, how did how how was it like to play with John? I mean, for for me, John Taylor, he's like probably one of the most underrated piano players in the history of jazz, if you ask me. Like. Yeah, I, I don't know about that. I, I know musicians love him. Um, yeah. Certainly in the UK, but I think even further afield, I think people know about John's playing, and especially musicians. Um, yeah. as, as, as for audiences and stuff, I, I don't really know. But um, but he was always brilliant to play with. He was he had a really nice um, sort of balance of being dangerous he loved to play yeah. in a dangerous way so he would mm -hmm. push things to the edge and to see what would happen and but he was also very very supportive as well really supportive like his comping was fantastic yeah. in fact there's a track i can't remember which track it, it is i think it might be a tune called uh, lardy dardy on on that album and we, we did two takes and i certainly played better on the other take but the take we chose was because the comping in my solo was just so fantastic. Oh, wow. I've got to use that. <laughs> I've got to use that because it's so beautiful. The comping is so beautiful. And I just chose that take because, not because I played good, because I played better on the other one, but just because the yeah. comping was so, so great. You know? Yeah, he, he, he's, he's amazing. I mean, at least the quartet records he did with him, that's... Again, one of those natural blends somehow you seem to have found with, with him, like really, really, really cool lines. I guess part of some connection you you guys somehow found. So that's quite cool. Well, well, I loved him. He was a, he was a fantastic man. I spent a lot of time with him because we did a lot of, uh, we worked a lot together. Um, did you tour with him also? For like Yeah, lots of tours. I, I did tours with him. With his band, uh, with my band, um, with a guy called Nick Planell, we did quite a few tours. With Kenny, oh. uh, Mike Gibbs, we did some tours. So, yeah, you know, I mean, every year I seem to have a tour with him. So, uh -huh. uh, and I did a lot of teaching with him. We were both the sort of jazz teachers at a university in, the, in York, which is the north of, um, north of England. 
So we used to meet up really quite regularly and would make sure we were there at the same time and stay in the same hotel. So we, you know, we used to hang out quite a lot and it's, it's lovely. Really yeah, I mean, I mean what, what, what are great that you played with? And I, I think this is the first time I, I saw you play live was Carla Blake. And uh-huh. I, I think I saw you in uh, near Venice with her big band. Oh, shit, I don't know. This was like 2006. Oh, yeah, I think oh, I remember you there. I, th- I think I remember you being there. That was uh, an outdoor gig, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, outdoor gig. And uh, how did you get that connection? Again, through like this Kenny Wheeler thing? or? Um, well, I, I had played with um, Swallow. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think with, with Mike Gibbs. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if that's the first time I met Swallow. I think it was. Um, she needed a saxophone player. Uh, so I can't remember who, how I got the call. But anyway, I got the call and uh, I went over. And um, she kept me in the band for a number of years. But, uh, yeah, you know, uh, what should I say about that? That was an interesting uh, time, you know. Um, and to be honest, it's it was quite regular work. I, yeah. I mean, I don't want to be disparaging or anything, but it was, you know, we do these really nice long tours, um, you know, three week tours in the summer. We went to all these beautiful places, especially in Southern Europe, all these festivals. Um, so for me, that was quite a good gig. Um, you know, as a working musician, it was something yeah. that I had to do to. Um, um, you know, it was enjoyable, and lots of nice people in the band, and the music was good. And, but I wouldn't say I, I could really relate to the music, or I yeah. particularly, it wasn't my thing. And I, I didn't feel I could be really a, as creative as I'd like to, yeah. be, which is always hard in big bands anyway. But, um, but you know, it was, it was a great experience. So you, you seem to like big bands, right? Um, some big bands. <laughs> I mean, because, okay, you did Kenny, you did Carl and Lay, <laughs> but let it be told, it's like a big band thing, right? So That's a big band thing, yeah. And, well, I've, I've always been playing in big bands. People in the UK, um, back when I, when I was starting, there was, a, there was a real big band network. Of, of amateur big bands and youth big bands, so every town had one. <clears throat> it, was, it was a way that musicians really started to play and learn about jazz in big bands. Um, but I would say my tradition with big bands is, is very untraditional. So I liked Brotherhood of Breath, which was quite free and obviously had a strong South African. Mm-hmm. Play the loose tubes, which was quite eclectic and had yeah. loads of different influences. Parlor's stuff was very uniquely hers. Um, yeah. Kenny Wheeler's music obviously just had such a strong Kenny identity as you'd expect. So these were not traditional big bands. Mm-hmm. Um, and the traditional big band thing is not really the music I. Wow. Not my favorite music. So if we looked at a bunch of my CDs, there would be very few big band recordings there. I like improvisation, yeah. I like um, interplay, and I like you know the intimate thing of smaller groups, personally. You know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But just another thing that I wanted to ask you, like, how did this uh, thing with the trio, talking about intimate moments uh, from, with Phronesis happen? Because it's like very intimate in a way. I also listened to the to the other day to it the other day on one of these streaming uh, thingies. And uh, how did this? Did I contact you or? Um, well, the way that happened was I was writing um, some projects for the Hessische Rundfunk, which is the Frankfurt Radio Big Band. Where you also played, right? Yeah. I I was asked to join that band. I forgot which year it was now, but um, I was in that band for four years, uh, yeah. and then I left. 
but um, it's a, you know what those German radio big bands are like. There, you know, it's an incredible opportunity. Um, you know, to have a professional jazz saxophone job like that. There aren't many in the world, so it felt like I got the opportunity. I thought, right, I'm going to go for it. So I went for it, but it turned out to be not right for me. It's right for somebody else, but it wasn't right for me. Um, but I, I'd started doing some writing projects with uh, that band. I think I did about five or six projects in the end, which is quite a lot of music because it was two sets. So I wrote, you know, maybe 12 sets of uh, music. Um, and the way those things work is you offer or you suggest something to the management and then think about it and maybe you need to send them uh, a recording of the band if they don't know who they are. And they get a lot of offers from all over the world. But um, so, you know, often you're not um, successful. But I, I, I mentioned Phrenesis. I think I put them in touch with each other and the, the management said, you know what, I think this would be nice. Would you like to do the arranging? So I did the arranging for of their music. Oh, wow. And there was, something that, there was something that they wanted to do. Um, at first, it was just some gigs, but they enjoyed it, and they suggested it as a recording. So, oh, wow. so after the gigs, we went back uh, maybe six months later and did the recording. Oh, nice. Cool stuff. But just, just to end with this, you, you're in Portugal now, so... Yeah. And you also mentioned teaching, so... You're teaching in Graz at the Jazz University. You yeah. like teaching? What are the aspects of teaching well, you like, let's say? Uh, I like teaching, yeah, I do like teaching. Um, I mean, I'm teaching now more than I've ever taught before. Um, I mean, I've always had teaching going on in my life, like a lot of musicians. Mm -hmm. Usually it was more like the equivalent of one day a week. And this, so this is quite a bit more for me, but I enjoy it a lot. I think the main thing I like about it is, um, is the creativeness about it. It feels creative. Uh -huh. It feels um, there's a, a good energy about it. You know, they're, they're excited to learn. They're excited by music. And it feels... Um, quite sort of joyful, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Actually, in some ways, it's the opposite to a radio big band. I don't mean to be too critical about any big band, but there's um, that job, which was a great, great job. Don't get me wrong. Um, yeah, sure. It didn't always feel like uh, with lots of enthusiasm and everyone being excited. But with students, because they've chosen to commit themselves to jazz and to the music, improvised music, uh, it feels like there's an enthusiasm, there's a momentum. Yeah. They're excited to learn, and that, that rubs off on me, and it, it feels it feels good for me to be part of that, you know. It feels yeah. it me feel young or ex excited about music. I can stick something on and say, check this, check it out. Oh, and we both... We'll all be excited by listening to some music, you know. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. it feels quite uh, uplifting, you know. Well, and they have the chance to work with one of the greats, man. <laughs> you know, oh, seriously. Great. Yeah. Cool, Julian.